So today we're going to talk about surviving your next MarTech implementation. And not just surviving, but thriving. Keeping your job, maybe you get a new job out of it, I don't know. Um, but the point is, we're, we're going to arm you with the information and knowledge that you need um, to get through this and to plan for it and be very successful along the way. Uh, so these are some of the things that I've picked up in my years of experience um, helping B2B marketers implement marketing technology. When I was at Compost, we were in the thick of it. Uh, you know, actually, literally, quite literally, going through the pains and the process and the people and the thought process of implementing content marketing platforms. And so I've collected that together, and, and I write about it quite a bit, you'll see, um, and speak about it. So we're going to go through this today. Um, our agenda, we're going to talk about common pitfalls that I've seen a lot of organizations make. I've made some of them myself. And so this really comes from experience and helping you prepare yourself and your team uh, to make sure that you avoid these pitfalls. We're going to go through key questions to ask any MarTech vendor. And just to clarify, I'm going to be um, technology agnostic today. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about marketing automation, social, um, collaboration tools. I'm really just talking generically about um, MarTech implementations. And then, obviously, the goal is that we're going to set you up for success. So many of you might be familiar. You may have gone to the MarTech conferences. But Scott Brinker estimates there's almost 4,000 marketing technologies out there today. Um, I really show you this visual, not because I think you can see any of these logos, but just to show you know, the plethora of um, choices that we're faced with as leading marketers out here today. Um, IDC puts the map into a little more concrete, uh, you know, kind of sort of four buckets that we talk, that we can think of, and this is a little more manageable to digest. But the point is, as marketers today, we have to be experts in so many more things than say five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. Um, we have to become starting to become technology experts along with our marketing disciplines. In fact, you know, Gartner predicted in 2012, Laura McClellan said back in 2012, marketers are actually going to outspend CIOs. So CMOs have now surpassed CIOs in their marketing spend. Um, and I've watched this. I used to work in the IT space for about 12, 15 years. Um, and I watched IT professionals kind of grasping onto that decision making and it moving out into the buying centers and to the marketing and the business units. Um, and so it's been interesting to kind of work in the thick of the industry, watching that migration of the technology spend moving out into business units into the marketers. I think it's more important than ever for us to, um, you know, know how to work together with our IT team as a marketing team so that we make sure, uh, you know, what we're bringing in is not going to be too disruptive. You know, IT guys love things to stay consistent and working. And marketers love to break things, basically. You know, we bring in new technologies and, and we, we break things. So I see Katrina out there smiling. We worked together when she was at Cisco um, and we had that exact experience. Um, of you know, the IT and marketing interactions. So it's really important for us to be aware of that as we move through this process. And what I'm finding is even though marketers were, you know, were being required to make these technology decisions and lead them and work with our IT departments, but we don't really know how to buy and implement technology. We know how to market. We're really great at doing that. Um, but as far as actually rolling out technology through our organization, getting you know, buy-in, making sure that we're setting up the various teams for success, making sure that we've heard their voices early on. Um, so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So first off, the first section is really thinking about common pitfalls that I've seen. My big advice to you, just kind of overlaid on this, is plan long so that you can execute quickly and you can avoid pitfalls. So just remember that. Like, I think sometimes, you know, I'll admit, I get a little impatient in the planning phase because I just want to get into execution mode. But you can save yourself a lot of worry, time, energy, effort um, by planning, taking the time to plan, and then execute quickly. It'll really speed things up for you. Um, just 
to kind of give you an overview of those top, fit, top pitfalls that I'm going to be going through today. We're going to talk about focusing on people and process, not just the technology. Sometimes you may not even need a technology to um, solve your problem. We're going to look at ways that we can um, simplify and, and reduce, not add to workloads. It's really important as marketers that we understand the user payoff with any technology. So, you know, you think about uh, the difference, be I, actually I'm jumping to my number six, but buyers and users are often very different people with very different motivations. So if we're the ones implementing the technology, running that project inside of an org, um, we need to be super aware of that. We're going to talk about keeping it simple and some ideas for doing just enough analysis is what I call it. All right, so first, people and process. So one of the, you know, this is a very old model, longer than, I could say longer than I've even worked in the industry because it's been around for 30 years. <laughs> um, but the point is, oftentimes we rush into a technology decision before we've actually clearly understood, um, you know, what is our current process or lack of process, what are our current, you know, issues, needs, um, resource needs when it comes to people, and how are we going to address that? Um, we need to think about this before we buy any technology or before we even decide that we need a technology, honestly. You're going to have to go through this process at some point. Um, so I always say do it early in the planning stage. Try to get this, you know, your um, processes identified as best that you can and make sure that you're really thinking about that as you select technologies that fit you and then also as you're rolling out. Um, I encourage people to go old school manual. You know, do it the old fashioned way, even if it's painful for, even if it's a day, a week or whatever that you're monitoring your process. The point is you will uncover so many things that you just haven't been aware of. It's this, this time of self introspection that you just need to force yourself to go through and, and document, you know, oh, we don't have a process for this. We have a hole here. We need to do something else. So don't be afraid of doing it manual. We don't have to do everything with some kind of technology um, tool to help us, especially when we're in this decision making process. Um, the other caution that I encourage people to think about, and I did this back in probably the mid 2000s, um, we were implementing Eloqua, which is a marketing automation technology, which is now part of the Oracle Marketing Cloud. But back then, Oracle didn't own them. So it was pretty new in the marketing automation, uh, you know, life cycle. And we, you know, we bought the tool, bought the technology, staffed up for it, hired an integrator, did all the things the way you should do it. Um, and it, it was going very well. And a year later, you know, we looked back and we realized, wow, we're still, you know, I was in publishing at the time, we're still churning out all these email newsletters and we're batch and blasting. And basically we had taken our email service provider and ported it into a marketing automation system. So we, we had to take a good look at, we fell into that trap of using old process in a new tool rather than actually using the new tool the way it should be used. So just be careful that you don't fall into that trap, if you will. Um, and again, I just, I really encourage us to do the planning phase, and that's really just to prevent, it may seem like it's taking longer on the front end, but what you'll find is that you don't have to pull things out, rip and replace, and start over, which is gonna take you longer in the long run, so. Um, I always encourage teams to really, you know, think about are we reducing workload, not adding to workload. We've all got busy teams. We've got lots going on. Our teams can only handle so much change at any given time. Um, and also think about the personality of your organization because, you know, I was talking about it with some people last night at dinner. A mid-market company has a much um, healthier appetite for change than, say, an enterprise organization. And you just have to understand the pace of change with your team um, and what they're ready for. But try to really respect your team as you go through this process. And along that vein, really think about what is the user payoff? You know, what the with them, what's in it for me? Why are we, you know, of course we can understand why we're bringing in a technology from an executive reporting standpoint, but when you have to actually have the users participate in the system um, in order to get that great reporting, you need to really be thinking about, okay, how am I going to convince them to use this technology? You know, is it going to save them time? Are they going to have better reporting? 
Are they going to have easier access to content that they've created and they can reuse it in a different way in the future? Um, whatever that payoff is, really understand that up and down your team and be overt about it. Like, you're kind of a salesperson if you really want to be honest about this. You're selling this technology through the organization. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough, keep it simple. And I would encourage you to think about this in your selection of tools also, especially, um, you know, depending on the size of your organization. But I really encourage people to only plan out about a year in advance because if you try to, you, we don't know where the tools are going to be in three years. In fact, we know that they're all going to be different. So I would just say, you know, get comfortable with planning quarterly and annual where you're trying to be and then choose your tool kind of based on that concept. Um, once you get through the data migration and setup of any tool, you shouldn't have to really administer it. I mean, the beauty of complex, you know, and I was, I, I was trying to think about this, like, well, does marketing automation, should it be super complex? And honestly, the stuff that we're doing, the beauty of these technologies is that they're simplifying these very complex processes. So I would say don't get yourself tangled up with something that, you know, a tool that makes it seem, oh, you're going to have to have an administrator and, you know, we're going to have to do all this work to make the tool perfect. And that's a kind of a big red flag for me, especially if you're a, you know, trying to be a nimble organization. Um, so I would just encourage you to consider, you know, those kinds of factors as you're moving through this process. Um, there's another key concept that I've kind of been floating out with people out in the world, you know, dinner last night and conversations yesterday, and I just blog about it and talk about it. Um, but it's the idea that, you know, as, as marketing teams, we've got such a variety of people with different technical expertise. So you might have designers working with copywriters, working with content creators, working with social, with analytics, with Marcom, with PR. So think about, you know, the skill sets and the aptitudes and the strength areas of all those different teams. You may have a very analytical person on your team who's like, yeah, yeah, I love tinkering and, you know, kind of working in a system. And then you've got a graphic designer who's like, I am not going to work in this tool because it, I can't do anything, <laughs> you know, it, it prevents me from uh, doing my job. So th what I encourage people to do is um, pick that lowest common denominator of technical expertise and make a star out of that person. If you can convince the biggest naysayer on your team that this tool is a good, you know, that helps them in some way and helps the team in some way, then the rest kind of fall in line because you know your early adopters are going to fall in line. So I like to go for my late adopters, win them over, and bring the two together in the middle. Um, so just a little tip, if you will. Again, I talk about analysis, but just enough analysis. Don't wait around for the perfect answer. It's never going to come. We're a lot smarter than we think we are, and we have a lot more data than we realize. Um, and if we don't have data, let's start collecting it. And the only way you know is to do. Um, so I just really encourage, you know, let's, let's do the analysis of whatever information we have, but don't spend too much time thinking about it, dwelling on it. And as I pointed out, in three years, it's probably going to be evolved anyway. So um, we don't have to worry so much about, like, making the perfect lifetime commitment <laughs> with a particular technology. Um, and I think if you follow the, you know, the basic fact of if, if you're choosing a tool that helps people be better at their job versus learning to be better at a tool necessarily, it's great that they become certified in the tool or what have you. But um, more importantly, are they able to do more, be better at their job, um, and perform that job better? If you stick to that, you will make the right decision. Um, this is the, the final and very important pitfall that I, I just want to make sure that people really understand. You, you really need to kind of think about your own buying cycle inside of your organization. So um, we do that all the time outwardly with our customers. We think about the decision process and we go and try to sell different people on, um, you know, our product or service and, and they're part of it. Um, so map your own organization. If you're the buyer or if you're the implementer, 
Know your motivations. Know who on the exec team do you have to convince that this is a great idea and why did, how are they gonna measure you, what do they care about, and how are you gonna get that information to them over time? And importantly, what is the timeline? It, you know, people might be expecting 30 to 90 day rollout, which is completely unrealistic for something that's gonna take six to 12 months. You just need to set those proper expectations and think about your different user groups inside of the organization. So again, just understand those interactions, those motivations, and how you can help, like I said, sell inside of the organization or prepare your team members to sell too. Sometimes your best users or your what you thought were gonna be your worst users that you convinced could be your best advocates inside of the organization um, to help say, you know, oh, this is great. I remember um, being up at Microsoft and talking with a content team there and one of the, um, she was definitely a doer. She's no longer at the organization. She's left and gone to another company, but she was a content creator like in the thick every day and just completely overwhelmed. And when she heard about what we could do for them, she was like, I could just cry with delight. You know, it was like the sweetest little like, oh, you just saved my life kind of feeling that it felt like from her. So just, you know, and she said it, of course, in front of her senior director and GM who made the final buying decision. So I was like, oh, thank you very much. You know, I wanted to slip her a 20 over across the table, but it was the point that, you know, it just, it worked out. Um, because we hit the nail on the head for what she needed help with. 